Welcome to Noon Hour Slides from the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery. We're located on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot, Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We pay our respects to First Nations and Métis ancestors and reaffirm our relationship with one another. We gratefully acknowledge funding from the City of Moose Jaw, Sask Arts, Sask Culture, Saskatchewan Lotteries, Canada Council for the Arts, Canadian Heritage, and the Government of Canada. I'm Vincent Hotelling, the Administrative Assistant here, and I'm here to welcome you to today's presentation, the last in the series. Dave Wentworth is here to talk about Iran. Welcome. Great. Well, thank you again, Vincent, for inviting me to come back and speak a second time. Some of you maybe would remember my presentation from last spring. I spoke about a trip I took to Tanzania um, and when the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery reached out to plan for the fall, I was really excited because um, another trip I'd like to talk about is when I went to Iran. And I think it just comes down to the simplest fact that nobody really goes there. We don't know a lot about it. And so it puts me, having gone there, it gives me the unique opportunity that I can talk about a destination that maybe a lot of people were have had curiosities about, been curious about, would like to go, but they don't know what it would be like. Um, we maybe have a stereotype in our head. And so today's presentation, when I was putting it together, my goal is to show you some great pictures of Iran and talk to you about what I did in Iran. I was there for two weeks and you know give you some information in terms of if you ever wanted to go to Iran what might you expect what would it look like there how would you prepare um so on and so forth and then at the end we'll have time where I'll um I'll stop sharing the screen which is the presentation you're looking at now and we can be face to face on zoom and what we can do is um, have a question and answer period so if there was anything I didn't touch on if you have any feedback observations there'll be time for all of that at the end so I'll just get going by diving into the presentation so again you can see from the title slide that my name is Dave Wentworth and um Today's presentation is titled, My Journey to Iran. And I included a picture of myself at Persepolis, which is probably one of Iran's most known um, sites. I was really excited to see Persepolis. Um, so that was a thrill. And I've got a few more pictures of Persepolis about uh, a little bit later. I think it was my second stop in Iran. So um, yeah, again, what my goal is today is to recap on that travel experience to Iran. Um, I traveled to Iran on a small group tour in May of 2015. I was there in late May. Um, so it might have even straddled a few days into June. I was on um, that tour operator did uh, 12 departures a year. And I was at the last departure of the year. Iran gets really, really hot in summer and we were starting to get a taste of that. And so an ideal time to visit Iran might've actually been March or April, coinciding perhaps with um, Persian New Year, which is called Nauruz. And that's a very festive time to be there. Or the autumn can be quite a lovely time to visit Iran. So um, definitely May, June, getting hot. And I'll talk a little bit later too. There is a dress code for men and women. And because you have to wear a bit more, you want to be mindful of that Mideastern temperature. I would say that Iran is not a typical choice for travel, um, but what awaits the adventurous travel can be found nowhere else on the planet. And I'll do my best to tell you what it was like, but truly um, there is no other sensation than being there. This was a destination that, you know, once we arrived and got, you know, in off the plane and into the into Tehran and we're meeting Iranians, and we're spending Iranian money. I kind of, I would say probably for the first week of my two weeks there, every day I was like, holy beep, am I in Iran? Um, and yeah. Um, so a bit about myself as well. Um, you know, I am new to Moose Jaw and I uh, would like to tell you a little bit about myself. So I am a travel agency owner and my agency is called Destination Whatever. You can find us online and social media. 
And I've been in the travel and tourism industry in one aspect or another my entire life. And I have a degree in international development, which I earned from Dalhousie University. Um, when I was there, I looked at tourism in developing countries as a way of um, development. Uh, I'm multilingual, I speak English, French, I'm pretty good in German, got some Spanish, Italian. I am a man of many languages. And one of my hats is I fill in up at the uh, German language school, which is called Das Schulhaus in Regina. So if you ever wanna learn German, let us know. We've got some classes starting in January. And I've got this curiosity for world culture and travel that's been a part of me ever since childhood and will be a part of me for my entire experience on this planet. And what I really love is to travel to off the beaten places. So I suppose that's probably what brought me to Iran as well. And I've been to 37 countries and counting. I'm really hoping to count some more. I've been waiting patiently to get going with travel as I know many of you have also. So like, why Iran? That was a question that got thrown in my face a lot. Um, and I can't recall how many times people would say, why do you wanna go there? And the way they would say there at the end, it was very affected voice. And it was a choice to go there that not a lot of people could understand. Well, I was really interested in learning about Iran because I knew many Persian people. Um, so I had a lot of friends for many years who were from Persia, from Iran, um, same, same, and they were the most wonderful people I could ever meet, super hospitable, um, you know, the hospitality uh, just knows no limits, and if you know anybody who's um, of Iranian or Persian background, you know that it's true that these people like to give and share. And that for me was a great opportunity to have my first experiences with the culture, trying some of the food, coming to people's houses for dinner. And as I would meet people from Iran, I thought, wow, these people are so nice. These people are so friendly, warm and inviting. And yet when I turn on the television, and to give you some perspective, I'm talking here about the 1990s. I'm a teenager in rural Nova Scotia. I would turn on the TV and I'd see CNN or whatever news outlet and they're burning American flags and they're chanting death to America and it's the axis of evil. And for me, I was just confused in that on the one hand, I'm seeing this one image in the media that's quite strong, that's painting a very hateful image of Iran. And yet I'm meeting people from Iran and they're warm and they're inviting and telling me, oh, you must come back with me. It's a great spot to go. There's so much to see. It's a, it's a really great place to visit. And so talk about receiving two real polar different messages. And so for all of those reasons, I wanted to go. And I started to notice an uptick in interest um, in around 2010, 2012. I think it was one of those years Rick Steves went to Iran. You might be familiar with his work. He pretty much does a lot of European content on public broadcasting and he has some great shows. And um, a few years later, Anthony Bourdain went. Anthony Bourdain's trip was maybe like, a few months before I went, pretty much when I saw Anthony went, I that was my green light to go ahead and book myself. And so I was seeing these American um, journalists go there and report back from Iran and they're having successful times. And so I really felt at that time I needed to get to Iran and make my own observations. And I was saying at the beginning, some of you might have been here um, at the, the top of the hour that Timing is everything with a trip to Iran. Um, I'm not naive to the fact that during the last US administration, during the Trump years, it was not a good time to go to Iran. Relationships were stressed between the two countries. And even though we're in Canada, we're traveling you know, on our Canadian passport, we do get affected um, by the US-Iranian relationship. So it was really good to go during the Barack Obama time and then another thing that was I was looking for is I wanted to go to Iran towards the end of my passport. So my passport was expiring in about a year, 18 months. And the reason for that is because if you have a visa for Iran, 
you cannot go to countries like Israel. And if you have stamps from Israel, you cannot go to a country like Iran. So when you're planning trips to those sorts of destinations, if you're thinking about the end game of your passport, if your passport's in its last stages, it could be a real good time to, uh, to do one of these countries. And that way you don't have to bear the stamp for that long before you get a new document and kind of a, a fresh slate, if you will. So the itinerary I did was with the tour operator I've traveled with 10 times. I love these folks. Um, Intrepid Travel is their name. And when I went to Iran in 2015, my itinerary kind of looked like the one on the top. Um, and they only had one itinerary to Iran. And they were doing 12 trips a year for 12 passengers. And so if it was 100% fully booked, which it was, people were going um, to Iran, but their capacity was 144 travelers a year. And um, since the, the amount of departures have grown, the amount of itineraries have grown. And so it is showing us again that the tourism interest is going, uh, growing in, um, uh, for Iran. So tours typically start in and out of Tehran and they pretty much make this circle. You can do this circle in a clockwise or a counterclockwise orientation. Um, so what you see is on the top is their standard departure, three-star hotels, a lot of, uh, you know, trains, uh, bus, that sort of transportation. And on the bottom, it's the upgraded comfort trip. So um, private minibus, uh, four-star hotels. And, and that's even a difference that's happened in Iran from when I went there. When I visited in 2015, there was pretty much just three-star hotel. There was no tourism demand for other options. And now that is growing. And now there are the, the responses that you'll find four-star hotels in Iran. So that's great. Um, so specifically here in the um, in the colored text, my stops and the way today's presentation will go is uh, Tehran, capital city, where the major airport's located, where you're coming in and out. Then we actually flew down to Shiraz, where we did Persepolis. It's about one hour away. We went to the Nomad Homestay. We went and went out to Caravanasarai and Yazd, and then we went by vehicle to Isfahan, Kashan, and then back up towards Tehran. So um, again, the images I'm showing you here, these maps are for the way the tours look now, um, but back then, you know, gosh, seven years ago, it was a little different. So imagine this is a postcard that I have sent you in the mail. Uh, if anybody can remember sending postcards, I still love sending postcards and I love receiving postcards. I love getting stamps from the other side of the planet. Well, if I was to send you a postcard on day one in Tehran, perhaps it would include a picture like the one I'm showing at the Golestan Palace, one of Tehran's most well-known sites. And we'll have another picture of that coming up. And I write, I've landed in the capital of the Islamic Republic of Iran. It's still a bit surreal that I'm even here. And here's me at the Golestan Palace. It's one of the most popular sites in the capital, and it's a must for visitors. There's so much opulence on display. Now that I'm here, I know it will be a great two weeks, but let me tell you about how I was able to get to Iran in the first place. But definitely the opulence is something I think about. You'll see a little bit later, we went to a mosque that's side name is literally the Glitter Mosque. It's one of the most elaborate things I've ever seen. And I can definitely tell you that, because uh, this was told to me by Iranians, that Iranians are extremists. They're extremely hospitable. They are extremely into opulence. They are extremely into glitter. They are extremely into flavors. They just do everything in the extreme and they will love you in the extreme when you come and pay a visit. So oftentimes people, even though I had traveled to Iran and at this point I've come back from Iran and I'm doing a presentation in the community such as this and people would still ask me, can you go to Iran? And it's like, well, obviously I, I've been to Iran. Uh, the short answer is yes. And even Americans, if you have a US passport and you might be thinking, well, Americans can't go to Iran, you can go to Iran. There are rules and I'm going to show you four rules. 
So if you are um, if you are Canadian, American, or British, and that would be defined as you're traveling on a Canadian, an American, or a British passport, um, you are not authorized to do independent travel. You can't simply just fly into Iran and say, "Hey, I'm going to book my own hotels and just you know see where the wind takes me." That sort of tourism is not permitted. You must be on an organized tour. Um, there are private tours. You don't have to do a small group tour. There are big bus group tours if you like to do that. Um, so you can do something private, but it has to be organized. Um, once you organize your tour, your tour operator, we move down to step two in Iran, will contact the Ministry of Invite. That is a governmental in, uh, department in Tehran, and they will give you an invitation number. And then this, if you've ever been to USSR, if you travel to some of the Soviet bloc countries, it was the same idea. You had to get an invitation number in order to advance to your visa. So number three, once you get your invite number, you can apply for your visa. Visas are issued through the Iranian interest section at the embassy of Pakistan in Washington, DC. That is the only consul, consul representation in North America. And um, really easy to deal with. Um, I had to send my passport, my application, my um, application fee, I believe it was about $100 and some pictures, of course, down to them. But my passport was returned within a couple of weeks and I had the visa, everything went along according to schedule. Um, they shot me an email when they received it just to let me know that it had got lost on its way. So I was extremely pleased with the communication from them and that part was easy. And um, yeah, once you get your visa, you're good to go. You just have to agree to abide by the rules set forth in the Islamic Republic. And those rules are that you have to follow a dress code in Iran and it is for men and women. And I think often we think about women, uh, we've seen what's called the chador, um, the black, uh, full black head to toe veil. Uh, we'll see some pictures of it, but it kind of reminds me of a nun's habit and that it goes from head to toe. It's dark, it covers a lot of your body, but you don't need to wear that. That is the most, that is like the highest level of covering. The minimum amount of covering for a woman is that you have to wear a head scarf. It could literally be on the bun of your hair, just slightly dangling down. Um, it does not need to be fully covered to the forehead. And uh, for both genders, you have to cover down to the elbow and you have to cover down to the ankle. So I was there, like I said earlier, in late May, early June, the weather was getting hot. A lot of days would be up around 33, 34, 35 degrees. And, uh, you know, I couldn't wear shorts. I could wear a polo short, uh, a polo shirt and long pants. And um, I was bacon, I was hot. It was definitely a little bit of an inconvenience, but you do it to go here. It's just part of how it is. Um, alcohol is not available in Iran. Um, you're not going to get a drink anywhere. I thought that maybe when I got there, there would be a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and behind the hotel bar, a couple beers would magically appear or some sort of an underground scene. I don't know what I was thinking, but there is no alcohol in Iran. So it will be a dry two weeks for you. Uh, they have non-alcoholic beer if you still need to get the sip. And I can remember flying in and it was about an hour before we landed in Tehran. I was on Lufthansa, I was coming in from Frankfurt and the flight attendants announced that we were getting close to Iran. And if you wanted a drink, this would be your last time to get a drink in. And I saw so many people um, press their buttons, raise their hands. Everybody wanted to get that drink in before um, you know, they couldn't have it any longer. It hasn't been alcohol there since the revolution in 79. Uh, you can't bring in immoral or objectionable items. So, um, you know, racy magazines. I know there was a joke at the beginning. I understand you had a pirate come into your Zoom last week and show you some pornography. Well, that content would be forbidden in Iran. You can't bring that in. Um, and you must stay on your tour the entire time, but there's lots of opportunity for free time and exploring on your own. Um, but it's just simply to say that you have to follow the tour that you booked to go to Iran. And in essence, you have to be at the same hotel as your guide, but often our guide, and I'll show you her in a minute, 
she would get us into the hotel, give us in whatever information we wanted, and then we could have a free evening. So we were able to go out on our own and take a taxi and go to a restaurant of our choice. And so we certainly didn't feel like we were, um, you know, under watch the whole time. No photography of police, federal buildings, or military infrastructure is allowed in Iran either. Um, I wouldn't even try it. If you did, it's almost a recipe to have someone in a uniform come over to you and get in your face. And, you know, and then you might have an argumentative moment. And I don't think that would be wanted. And finally, lots of cash. No credit cards are accepted in Iran. So uh, I have a slide showing the money here, but uh, Western banking does not work in Iran. So for flights to get to Iran, oops, uh, for flights, uh, there are no non-stops from North America to Iran. There used to be back in the 70s, you could fly from New York to Tehran every day. Unfortunately, uh, when the US-Iranian relationships ended, those flights ended. So now you are going to have to go through a European city or a Middle Eastern city. I've put a few of those on the screen. Um, I've sent people to Iran um, and they've used all these different sorts of airlines. So they're all options with daily services. Um, back to the whole idea on money. So Iran is a cash economy. Um, and compared to Western nations, the prices are extremely affordable. Iran remains one of the most affordable countries I have ever traveled in. And what amazing quality of things I received for my money, whether we're talking about the quality of a food at a restaurant or some of the souvenirs that I bought to bring home, everything was great. Um, in fact, with food, uh, what I love the most about it is that Iran doesn't import. They don't have a lot of trading relationships, certainly no American foods being brought in there. So you know, nothing against American food, but everything in Iran was grown there. It was organic, it was fresh. It was just, it was eating like the way we all used to. It was getting back to that. Western credit cards, uh, bank cards just simply will not work in Iran. You will see ATMs there, but those are for Iranian banks. So they have their own network. It works for them, it won't work for you. And online banking is unavailable. I remember one day trying to log in on the TD and I would go to my TD website, I'd go to the online bank login and I was there was a message that came up that basically said, from where you are, you cannot look at this. Um, so you won't be able to get into your bank accounts. You've got to bring US dollars or euros. Those are the preferred currencies and are really easy to exchange it. Everywhere as we went in Iran, there was uh, an exchanger waiting for us if we needed them. Really friendly, easy to deal with. Everybody has the same rate. Um, One dollar Canadian equals 33,000 Iranian rials. So um, if you had 30 bucks Canadian, you would be a millionaire in Iran. That's pretty cool. Um, and then to make the money a little bit more complicated, to bend your mind a little bit, in Iran, 10 rials equals a tomen. So they'll often say, often you'll hear that the price for something is 10,000 tomen. They're really, they want 100,000 rials. And of course, when you're flipping through your wallet of all this money, you're, you need to look for the 100,000. I kind of started to give up on using Iranian money about three or four days into my trip because I would just kind of open up my wallet and people would just point to exactly what they wanted. And everyone was so honest. I don't know if it will change as people start to make their way to Iran and tourism becomes a thing. But right now, and based on my experiences, you know, because tourism hasn't had a chance to uh, become manipulative in any way, people haven't learned to take advantage of tourists. Everybody was so honest and so kind. I mean, I could literally leave a stack of money sitting on a table and come back to it the next day and it would just be sitting there. Like people are not looking to take advantage. And so um, that to me just stands out with the money because towards the end, I literally would just kind of like open up this envelope of cash and people would just help themselves. And they were always honest. One um, thing I'll show as well is that the cost of a meal um, on average, $3.75 for a full meal. So, you know, to think about being in Iran, eating two to three meals a day, often, you know, breakfast was included at the hotel. Um, so if we're looking at two meals a day at 375, 
um, times two weeks, you know, yes, you have to bring cash, but it's not like you have to bring, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to keep yourself going for a couple of weeks. And admissions, uh, if we needed to buy tickets to go to places that were not included already on our tour, those would be a little bit more than a meal, but still very reasonable, um, around five and a quarter. So our journey begins today in Tehran. Tehran, Tehran, I've heard it, Tehran. Um, I, pick your poison, you can say it however you want. Um, most of the time, by the time you fly the overnight flight to Europe and then get a later flight um, to get into Tehran, you're normally arriving in the Islamic Republic somewhere between midnight and three o'clock in the morning. It's just how flights go. So more likely, than not, your first image of Iran will be nighttime. And so we landed in Tehran. I can remember, um, again, going back to that Lufthansa flight coming into the capital, rolling up to the airport and thinking, you know, here we go. Like, what is this going to be like? Like, am I going to step off the plane and be met with a wall of hatred towards the West? And is that going to affect me as a Westerner? Or will it be positive? It was totally positive. I can remember getting off the plane, going through customs. It was so quick and easy. Um, going to grab my bag, um, seeing people wearing shirts in the airport, like men with t-shirts that had U.S. flags on them, did not expect to see that. And it kind of quickly became apparent that Tehran is no different than any other major city in the world. It is just like New York, London, any of those big, big spots. So we got in at like three in the morning, um, went to our hotels, slept for a few hours. And at noon is when we had our rendezvous to meet with our guide. In my head, I had thought that a guide on a tour in Iran would be a male, would be older and would be really strict, dressed in a uniform the whole time. I had that image in my head and our guide was this individual. Her name is Nadia, 26 years old, and it was delightful to tour Iran with a 26-year-old female because um, talk about an opportunity to get perspective on what it's like uh, as a, a younger person in Iran, a person uh, with um, goals and career ambitions, and a person who, you know, wants to respect the culture and the tradition she comes from, but also be a part of the modern world. Um, so there were days where we would be driving a couple of hours and I could just listen to Nadia talk like for hours and hours and hours just to gain that perspective. Um, and she was curious about us as well. That's why she wanted to work as a guide. She had followed her father's desires to get a master's in chemistry and was working in a laboratory but gave it up to become a tour guide because she wanted to have the opportunity to interact with people from outside of Iran. She had an appetite for the globe. So she was as interested in learning about where we came from as we were in learning about her daily life in Iran. So after we met everybody, we got going, we took a tour around Tehran. This is the Golstan Palace. I showed you that earlier from my um, postcard. And this is a complex of several buildings located in downtown Tehran. It's probably the number one attraction in Tehran. And it's one of the most majestic palaces going back in Persian history. And one thing you'll notice in Iran, and you'll see it in the pictures, if you look at the little details, I don't think the buildings are overly, you know, impressive architecture. I don't think the way the buildings are made will give you the ooh-ah sensation. But when you look up close and you see the detail and you see the inlay and you see the prayers, the scripts that have been carved and beveled into the buildings, then you have the, that, that appreciation for what uh, makes Persian architecture so splendid. Of course, the food of Iran. Um, lots of people go to Iran and their mouths are already dripping by the time they walk off the plane because they're, they know they're in for good flavor, good uh, things to eat. Um, and as I was saying earlier, all of the food is fresh. All the food is from Iran. Everything is kind of done on their own within their own country, within their own borders. They've got very used to not trading, so having to do it for themselves. So everything is fresh. 
everything tastes great. And you saw a few slides ago, you can get a great meal for like four bucks. That would be two kebabs, a bunch of rice, some roasted vegetables, some flatbread, a full meal for four bucks. I can't even get a coffee sometimes for that. Here's a picture of the food. This would be actually a really typical uh, meal. Um, the bottled drink is like a lime drink that uh, I was really into in Iran. They have it salted and they have it with sugar. So you can get it tart, you can get it sweet. Um, and then typically it would be some meat. So some ground beef or some chicken chunks that would be cooked um, in a tomato sauce, or sometimes it would be skewered and cooked like in a kebab style. Um, but lots of spice, a lot of the flavors that you might associate with like Turkish cuisine. So sumac, cumin, cinnamon, um, all those warm, fragrant spices. You could smell Iranian food, and I mean that in a good way, well before it would arrive to your table because the aroma would waft through the air. And another thing Iranians like is the rice. That's a really component part of the meal. Um, one food that is very popular in Iran is called tadig, and it's when you cook the rice and it caramelizes on the bottom. It, we some would almost say it gets burnt at the bottom. Those burnt crunchy bits are actually the most popular um, thing. And I had had Tadi before I went and I noticed like on day four or five, I hadn't been served any. And I said to my dad, I'm like, when they bring the rice, how come I'm not getting the Tadi? And she said, oh, that's the best part. The cook eats all that. So Iranians love rice, whether it's cooked well or just cooked regularly. And uh, they love to garnish it. So here we have some saffron, some pomegranate seeds. Um, they wouldn't just serve rice on its own. It must have some sort of color, some additive, additive to make it fancier. Iranians also love tea. That is the main drink. I had coffee. I needed coffee to start my day. Uh, I had no problem getting that there. But tea is the most common drink. And, you know, when I think about our evenings when we were done touring, what we would typically end up doing in Iran, because again, you can't go out and have beers. That's not going to happen. We would go out and have tea or ice cream. Those would be our two things. Uh, lots of sugar. Iranians love, again, Iranians are extremists. They love extreme amounts of sugar in their tea. And I can remember seeing people in Iran take a sugar cube and park it behind their tea and drink their tea through the sugar cube. And I just thought that's really, really, really sweet, but it's how they like it. And again, just to recap on breakfast, I didn't take many pictures of my breakfast, if at all, but it would typically be the same spread and it would be put out at the hotels. And so we would eat that at the hotel before we'd go and see things. And we would have unleavened breads, tomato, cheese, yogurt, some juice, some coffee. Maybe there'd be a piece of fruit and uh, yeah. So my Tehran takeaway, um, I didn't spend a lot of time in Tehran. We left, I think, on the second day and only to come back at the very end. It is the capital. It has all the things that would go along with other cities of its caliber. So air quality, traffic, urban sprawl. There are good areas. There are bad areas. But uh, it's a big city. And I, you know, I, like most places, I want to get out of the city. I want to go see the landscape. I want to go see the other spots. So Tehran is not a spot to linger. Uh, transportation, though, if you want to get around and explore the city, it's super easy. I did it all. Cabs, uh, they're abundant. Again, cabs are honest. Uh, the subway is clean. It's efficient. I think it works out to like 12 cents for a subway ticket and I mean to use a phrase like eat off the floor like it's so clean and so we took the subway and we went around some of the neighborhoods of Tehran it was great but after two days we took a plane down to Shiraz down to the south I had only heard of Shiraz before because of Shiraz wine um, and the Shiraz wine that's popular for South Australia from South Australia was actually sent to us South Australia um, before the revolution um, in 1979. Um, and so what's grown in Australia and associated with Australian wine actually goes back to this part of the world. And so the city's name Shiraz comes, you know, the wine, all of that comes from there. And today Shiraz is known for traditional gardens and a lot of poets that come from there. 
So Iranians have a great deal of pride in their written history, their literature, their poetry, songs, anything like that. And many of the greats come from Shiraz. And here I am at Hafez tomb. And you can see people have come to um, pay pilgrimage. There's rose petals and there's, um, I don't know if you can see it totally well on the picture, but on the top of the tomb, it's even been carved with inlay um, of some of Hafez's writings. And then above the tomb is this canopy, this minaret. And um, I just, again would point out like look at the detail work like look at those little details that inlay that was put in there and this is from hundreds of years ago and also the use of symmetry and balance this is this has so many reflection pieces within it that you truly could stare at it for hours and and, and lose yourself in it if you opened your mind to it and i love that Another thing that was super cool in Shiraz, and I will never forget, was visiting the Shara Chagara Mosque, which I was referring to earlier as the Glitter Mosque. So here it is from the outside. Um, and we went obviously at nighttime, and that's when a lot of people were going for prayers. And so it was a really neat time to see it because not only, you know, with, did I want to see all the glitter, I wanted to see the razzle dazzle. Um, it was great to see people go to prayer and do, this is their evening routine. And again, understanding what daily life in Iran would be like. So this is a funerary mosque um, and it is one of the holiest cities in all of Iran. But again, it's open to all visitors. In fact, you know, and I, I can say it every single time, but I, I'll try not to, you know, nobody in Iran said, no, you can't come here or no, you can't look at that. Everybody wanted to show. They were so excited to have that opportunity. And uh, people have been coming here as a site of pilgrimage since the 14th century. Let's take a look at the Razzle Dazzle. You can see on the left an opulent chandelier and all of the um, glitter um, and inlay that goes up into the, the peaks of the ceiling, up into the various inlays. It's completely shroud. It, it was almost hard to take a picture in here because it just glittered everywhere. And um, here's a picture of me with the guys on our tour. So at this mosque, there was one side of it for men, one side for women. So we were separated by gender. Everybody saw pretty much the same thing because what you find on the left, you find on the right. But uh, yeah, you can see again, I'm here with the guys on the group. And again, you can see that, you know, again, we're all abiding by the dress code. Uh, this would be about as revealing as you could get in Iran. And just another picture from the Glitter Mosque. You can see why I told you it's called that. And again, if you're not blinded by all the silver, you can see there's green emerald, um, curly cues, and other forms of decor. On the blue, we have um, script work that's put in there. So it's all these little details that add to the elaboration. Then from Shiraz, the next day, um, we went over to Persepolis, which is a one hour drive. So we just did that as a day visit and came back to our hotel in Shiraz. Um, it's located next to the Zagros Mountains and it goes back to 515 BC. And it's been UNESCO designated since 1979. Um, super reachable from Shiraz. Most, if you meet any travelers in Shiraz, they're all there to see the same things. Persepolis is on that list. What sh really stood out for me with Persepolis is that I had went to Turkey two years before my trip to Iran. And if you've ever been to Turkey, if you've ever looked at going to Turkey, um, you'll see that Ephesus is on most itineraries. And Ephesus is also, a, you know, the remains of an ancient city from prehistory but Ephesus is right next to the cruise ports and it's always busy there's thousands of people on the daily that make their way to Ephesus and so I can remember going to Ephesus and thinking wow it's really cool but in every single picture I have of Ephesus there's people in the background there's a crowd there we went to Persepolis and you can see from this picture I mean to use a phrase you could swing a cat because there was just nothing big like it was just us and Persepolis. I think there might've been a few, like count them on one hand, Iranian tourists there. There was no other Western groups. We had this to ourselves. You can just see, it's just me and Persepolis.
I love that. So yeah, there's a few people in the background. And I was going through the pictures too, and even though my pictures are from 2015, I feel that digital cameras have come so far that I would go back to Iran just to take my pictures over again because, uh, yeah, all the little details. And little details like this, I did find this one, um, which I enjoyed, that's of a lion, and it goes back again to the relationships that Iran or early Iranians, early Persians had with Romans, with Greeks, um, you know, they interacted with everybody. They are depictions of their relationship with early Ethiopians, with people from India. I mean, look on the map, Iran is a crossroads country and the Persian empire goes back to the very beginning. From Shiraz, we did go to our homestay. I couldn't really find much in the line of pictures for there. Um, I do think in a part that homestay is a way to break up what is otherwise a long drive from Shiraz to Caravanasarai. Um, it's really cool at the homestay. We spent the night staying at a person's house, having meal. Um, Nadia was there to act as our translator. And again, it was a great opportunity to see the role of women in Iranian society. Um, you know, the media would have you believe that Iranian women are covered in veils and have no power and are just basically pushed around. And when you travel in Iran, you actually realize that uh, it could almost be argued that women are running the show. There's more women in uh, professional employment than men. There's more women in graduate degrees in the home. Uh, the females rule the roost. And another interesting thing about that homestay is in Iran, they are still very much a part of a multi-generation household. So the grandparents come to live with the family. The kids are there. Um, Iranian houses are very busy, lots of people. The idea of just having a house and living on your own would be completely foreign. Well, anyway, back to Caravan Asarai. So the I like this picture with the trucks because I was taking this from the caravan, which is like an old uh, walled citadel fortress. And they would have been hotels for safety, uh, for pilgrims going back to a time when travel would have been much different. And you could, of course, not just stay there, but there was an area for you to bring your horses in and they could get fed and the walls kept out any riffraff. And so these ancient structures still exist in Iran and they've been converted for the most part to heritage hotels. So, I mean, you're staying in this building that has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of history. And I can remember laying down on my bed and just trying to think about, you know, the people that would have come here before. And I mean, I'm going back to like the 1400s, the 1500s, like Marco Polo, like early people on the Silk Route. You can just see him behind me. Uh, here I am sitting up on the, you could go up to the top of the walls uh, at the ramparts and look out and you can just see just nothing for miles. This is down and heading towards the southwestern corner of Iran, which is pretty much desert. There's not much more in the landscape than that. And that's my friend who I traveled with, by the way. I haven't shown her, but uh, we actually had met in China and we were sitting around one day in China and I said, oh, what do you want to do for an upcoming trip? And she said, oh, it's really silly. I always want to go to Iran. And we latched on to each other and said, let's make that come true. I love meeting new people traveling. It's the best. So from Caravan Asarai, we continued pushing further into Southwest Iran towards the city of Yazd. Uh, Yazd is famous for its textiles. It is where you want to buy your clothing. If you want to buy any Uranian garments, if you want to buy that Persian rug, if you've been setting aside some reals for that, this is the place to do it. And Persian rugs are, are not affordable. I can remember like a, a dining room table sized rug would be about 2000 US and the carpet vendors here are set up for a credit card. They are the only people that set up with a credit card. They literally set it up through a bank through Dubai so they can help you out because they know you haven't carried that much money. Um, and not everybody in our group was buying a Persian rug, but some people did and they're really happy with those purchases. Those would definitely be your top uh, price point purchase in Iran would be a rug and you'd get it in Yazd.
And then we look at, um, and here I am pictured at the famous Jame Mosque. That means the Friday Mosque. Friday is the time for prayer in um, Islamic cultures. And I was taken here by all the different shades of blue, the cobalt blues, the aquamarine, the different shades were just entrancing. I'm having a little meditative moment. And even if you look down at the bottom on the floor, you can see the carpet of this mosque, which I'm sure has been there for so many years and treaded on by so many footsteps. It's still, it's an excellent quality and it has just so much little detail that, you know, again, for me, I would lose myself for hours. Well, speaking of old time religion and the city of Yaz, this brings me to the other site that I can remember seeing there. And with all respects, this was one of the most unusual, dare I say, for me, almost freaky deaky sort of sites that I've ever seen in, in my travels. And it's called the Towers of Silence. And this is where um, in Zoroastrian faith, so is, Iran is an Islamic country, but it is also where you will find the Zoroastrian religion and within the Zoroastrians, they would send their dead to the Towers of Silence for decontamination. That means that the dead bodies would sit up on the top of the hill in the Tower of Silence until they were sun bleached and their bones were picked by buzzards and other types of wild critters. Um, that was their tradition. It was that way until the 70s when it was outlawed. Um, it is still seen as one of the holiest sites. And just to let you know that um, they wouldn't leave bodies up there forever. Once they were cleaned and the skeletons were bleached, they were looking for the cleanest skeleton possible, then they would have a burial. They wanted to clean the skeleton before sending it to the Western world or to the other world, to the afterlife. So yeah, the Towers of Silence, that was an unusual day. Oh my gosh, I can remember hiking up to the tower too, all those steps, and I think it was 37, and of course I'm in my black polo, my black shorts. What an effort. Yaz also has these old walls that go back to the um, Silk Route times, and I loved having free time in Yaz because my friend and I, we walked around and we would almost kind of get lost. Um, we'd always find our way out, but along the way we would stumble upon cafes and other places. And again, keep in mind that our guide is back at the hotel. So we're still on the tour, but we have free time. We're exploring Iran in our own way. We certainly are not tethered to the leader. We have free time to explore. And uh, Yaz is one of the driest and hottest cities. So again, you saw a few pictures ago um, at the caravan, it's desert landscape here. Um, you know, it was so hot walking up to the uh, Towers of Silence. It's here where um, you're right next to the Lot Desert, which is one of the, there's, I think it's debated which spot is the hottest spot on the planet, depending on how you measure it. But Lot Desert is normally in that list of hottest places in the planet. Real, real, real hot. We left Yazd and we drove to our final um, city, which was about four hours away. We drove and we went to the city of um, Esfahan with an E or Isfahan with an I. It can be spelt both ways, both are recognized. And amongst Iranians, this is a city of great pride. Persians say that Esfahan is half of the world uh, because it is so beautiful with its gardens, its covered bridges, the Shah Mosque, which you see pictured here. This is considered to be one of the best, one of the must see mosques in all of Iran and very wide boulevards. And I also heard it compared when we were there, they said, oh, our city is like Paris because we have these beautiful wide boulevards with trees going down the middle. And it is, it's a beautiful city. Um, so what you're looking at here, the Shah Mosque that was completed in 1629. And it's known um, for two things. It's acoustic property. So when you're inside the mosque, you could whisper and it will be heard in a loud, full voice. So we think about prayers, we think about imams delivering speeches. This would be a great spot for that. And then also it's reflections. And what I mean by that is the gardens and the pools and any, any part of the building is designed that if you could almost close it onto itself, it would be perfectly symmetrical, perfectly reflective. And then right next to that mosque is a huge market. You can see a picture of me in here um, at the spice market. I just loved all, all the spices were stacked up. I love the aromas of all the spices. 
Um, and I think here we're getting right down to the drips and drabs of our time in Iran. So we might have been doing a bit more shopping here to bring home our souvenirs, spend up any of our remaining Iranian rials. And a beautiful, this is from the inside of the, the Shah Mosque. And again, you can see how that ceiling is um, very inspirational, how there's beautiful symmetry in there. There's lots that you can look at. Kind of reminds me of those 3D paintings, if you remember those, where people could stare into it and eventually, I don't know, you'll see a peacock or an elephant or something. Well, after our time at Esfahan, of course, it, you know, we are drawing to a close of two weeks in Iran. So we hit the road and from Isfahan to Tehran, it's four and a half hour drive. So they stopped us uh, outside of Kashan in, in this village called Abyene, which is the red village. We stop, typically people will stop here for a couple of hours to break up the drive to Tehran. So it's not an overnight spot, but it is a fun spot to visit. And the houses here are made out of uh, mud and silt that's collected from the nearby area. That mud and silt has a reddish complexion to it. So the buildings have a unique hue to them. And it's a very traditional city. So I think especially before we kind of get back into Iran or back into Tehran and back into the big city, it, for travelers, it's a great time on the itinerary to get that last kind of glimpse at a smaller, quieter Iranian town. And just at the um, entrance to the city, and we had seen actually when we arrived at the airport and we were taking our shuttle into uh to tehran we actually drove by this place but because it was the middle of the night we were so tired we didn't really notice but it is the mausoleum of um Khomeini. and you might have heard of Khomeini, of course from iranian history he was a big player in the um in the revolution in things if we go back to u.s iranian revolution um u.s iranian relationships like the u.s embassy siege um, so he was active then, and he's kind of seen as a um, forefather with a great a lot of respect for him for what he did for basically making Iran what it is today. Whether you love or you hate it, this was the man that did it. And his uh, mausoleum, it, it, to me, it almost reminded me of a Disney World scenario. I remember getting there and the parking lot was so huge and everybody seemed to be there. It was definitely one of the busiest sites we had seen. His picture was all over the place, the way you would see Mickey Mouse at Walt Disney World and the amount of concessions and stands and things that you could buy. I even came home with um, Komeni fridge magnets. I didn't even, I think I even have some Komeni playing cards. I mean, they just had everything here. It was a marketing machine. So just to wrap up before I take any questions, people have a few quick questions that I get asked so many times about Iran that I thought I would just mention them in the presentation. Would I go back to Iran? The answer to that is perhaps in the right situation, I wouldn't hesitate. The reason why I'm a little vague on that is because I really fulfilled everything I wanted to do. So personally speaking, I mean, I don't know if I want to go back to Iran just to do the exact same trip I already did. I fulfilled that. Um, having said that, I recommend it 100%. And I think it's a suitable destination for all. I've had people ask me, is it a suitable destination for solo women? Is it a set, uh, okay for families, younger, older, um, GLBT? For anybody, I have sent all of these people, all walks of lifestyle to Iran. I've traveled with a diverse group in Iran. We all had a wonderful time. So don't let the perceptions startle you. And by the way, back there, I was drinking a date milkshake. It was one of the tastiest beverages I had in Iran. I get asked a lot, is it safe there? We'll kind of continue, and who goes there? Well, kind of continuing on that idea of safety, um, you know, I never had any hassles. I never had aggressive behavior towards Westerners. I had a conversation with my friends before we went where we talked about what would we do if somebody was burning an American flag in front of us or saying, you know, thinking we were Americans and saying, oh, well, death to America. And like what, you know, I remember even thinking, would somebody spit in my face? Would they be that vulgar towards uh, a Westerner? Well, all of those thoughts that I had in my head uh, absolutely were not true. Nothing like that came close to happening. In fact, um, quite the opposite. It was this 
um, open light of wanting to get to know about people and, you know, that people are people and that does not reflect governments. And so we were totally safe. And as far as who goes there, um, any of the travelers I met going to Iran um, were not people that uh, hadn't traveled a lot. They were typically people that had actually traveled quite a bit and had been to a quite a lot of other places. So they were, I guess, finally getting around to Iran. Um, so you, you're thinking about people with a high amount of travel, typically a higher level of education. Um, a lot of people that are traveling there are university graduates, uh, for example. And finally, what surprised me the most, um, you know, again, that a country can be so different in its reality than it gets depicted in the news. So again, I was talking about, you know, having grown up in the 1990s, you saw, you know, so many images from uh, Iran on the news that were startling. You'd hear it being called the axis of evil. Um, I think about that Not Without My Daughter mo movie that didn't put Iran in a good light. Um, and yet all of that was just a media image that because I was exposed to it, it's all I knew. Um, and now that I went there, I just definitely think about that old adage, not to judge a book on its cover. So yeah, um, I'm going to move into any questions, but just before I disconnect the scene, if you liked hearing from me today, if you'd like to keep in touch with me, um, there's my social media info for Facebook and Instagram. You can reach me. I'm at Destination Whatever. Um, I also have a YouTube channel. My YouTube identity is just my name, Dave Wentworth. I had a fun video up there recently of the Halloween decorations here in Moose Jaw. So I love getting video content up there. Um, right now, obviously lots of local stuff happening, uh, hopefully some international stuff happening soon as well. All right, uh, we do have a few questions here. Um, so um, one person here, Christine uh, was asked, or it was, no, Stuart was asking, is ice cream available there? And ice cream was probably one of our top things to do in the evening. We couldn't go out for beers. So going out for an ice cream was like the highlight. And I probably had ice cream most every day. Um, lots of flavors. And if you've ever had Turkish ice cream, it, it's kind of like that texture. It's, uh, it's different than the ice cream we have here. Very delicious. If anybody else has any questions, I would invite you to put it in chat or turn on your microphone and let's hear. I got one. Um, how do you know how much money to bring? Like if you can't get at it when you're when you're there, how do you sort of plan for that? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a great question. I obviously didn't want to get cut short. No one did because again, you can't get a Western Union. You can't, you know, get money sent to you so we took a, i took 100 us a day i was there for 15 days so i went over with 1500 bucks and i left iran with like 1100 us so um i guess i would say that you know bring more you can obviously return it to the bank when i'm advising people i do tell them to still bring 100 us a day because what if you see something and you want to buy it you won't know until you get there but yeah very very affordable uh, I've got a question coming in from the chat room and the person is asking, what was customs like? What was uh, airport customs? Yeah, so customs for me, I was prepared in my mind as we were flying into Iran. I was going through every single possible question and preparing an answer. And that was um, not needed because when I got there, they looked at my visa, I guess because you've already been so scrutinized by the time you've got that visa that they just really just stamped me in. They didn't even want to chit chat. They weren't asking how long I was there for, why I had come to Iran. And I had expected again to go through every single question, to go through my employment background, my educational background, and none of that came into play. I would say that the uh, airport in Iran is also quite nice. There's two airports in Iran. There's an international one where you come at for your international in and out. And uh, yeah, it's I think it was built in 2007, so it's fairly um, new. And there is a domestic airport, which is actually the bigger airport in Tehran. 
And that one's a little bit more chaotic, but we were there with our guide and, and that airport was, was manageable. Yeah. 